Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. We're buzzing as always, and I'm super pumped to have a fellow Canadian and incredible artist coming on the show today. We have Trevor Jones, originally from Canada, set out in 1996 with a backpack and a taste for adventure. Three years, four continents later, found himself in Scotland, fell in love and never left. Hate to see a good Canadian leave, but a big dub for Scotland. This man has done a little bit of everything. In 2015, he co-founded Creative Tech and that company provided air services to artists and he left art and healthcare and teaching to focus on his own art career has pretty much hijacked the images in the Royal Scottish Academy and National Gallery of Scotland to showcase his own work. Bunch of AR paintings later, bunch of crazy tech initiatives and the one and only Bitcoin angel which sold for a very small amount of money, which we'll get into later. Bunch of cool stuff. Super, super pumped to have this loud on the show. Trevor Jones, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here and great to, to speak to a fellow Canadian as well. So yeah, looking forward to the conversations. Super pumped to have you on, man. I, normally we get right into the sort of the career stuff and all that, but like I'm a big travel guy myself. I'd love to start with a good old travel story. 1996, setting out with a backpack, a little bit of adventure here and there. Did you ever think that this would just be like, I'm gone, never coming back? Like, give me a couple of your crazy stories from that backpack rip of the world. I, uh, yeah, so I was, what, 25, I think. Um, I was with a, a friend, a, a, a hockey player. Uh, he was a professional, um, semi-professional hockey player. Um, and this was in a small town of Vernon, where I was living at the time in British Columbia. And uh, it it was not a good situation we were out clubbing and, and he ended up getting into a fight and and uh ended up um dying and in a, a sorry for bringing it in so down Jeez. so quickly but uh it was um it was a rough place where i grew up you know like many small towns in in canada and i didn't know i was 25 i was working in a building supplies warehouse driving forklift uh part-time waitering you know making ends meet um and i just said like i need to get the heck out of here and and see the world and just find find myself and and so I got my my passport and jumped on a plane to Australia and that was in yeah 1996 and just kept on traveling around I I didn't think I would be I had a year visa uh, I ended up coming back home after I think five or six months because I got homesick but then after another five or six months at home I, th- I thought like this is ridiculous I what am I doing here I need to get out again and I uh, left to the UK traveled I had a, a UK ancestry visa. My grandfather was uh, was British. Um, came over from from the UK, so uh, that kind of set me up to create a base from the UK. I was in London for a while, um, and then you know decided to go up and see Scotland. And it was just the this cold, rugged place uh, with a lot of um, friendly, drunk people, and it kind of reminded me of home. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I ended up, ended up staying, and uh, yeah, I mean. Again, it was, I was about early 30s. I was just working and traveling, working and traveling, and wasn't planning on staying for so long. And here I am, what, 23 years later. What a story. Sorry to hear about your mate, by the way. Um, and then on the art side of things, like when you were a young kid, did you always have the sort of artistic sauce to your repertoire? Like someone like me, for example, who has, you know, not even 1% of my body is artistic. I would kill. I'd do bad things to even have one one hundredth of your talent. And obviously you worked your ass off and you put in your, you know, tens of thousands of hours. But like, did you always have the artistic sort of skill set or, or was that perhaps something that you just acquired later on in life? It. I actually, I did, you know, um, I didn't, there was no uh, artist in my family. I didn't come from an artist's family. My dad was a, a mechanic, you know, mom was a, a housewife. And, uh, and so although I did, do well at art in school. Um, you know, and I took art classes in high school because it was an easy mark for me and not because I was right <laughs> on doing that. I love sports as well. You know, I was more interested in, in, uh, in basketball and, and, you know, kind of, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but it was definitely, um, it wasn't art that wasn't, was never the goal, but I did have a, a, a talent for it. You know, I did, I was always kind of top of the class and, in my art classes and in elementary school and high school, but it wasn't until I was thirty-one ish before I thought like I need to I need to be an artist. So it was a very very strange decision to 
you know, dedicate my life to being an artist at, uh, in my thirties, it was, yeah, but here I am. Yeah. That, that's, that seems like a little late. What, what, what events perhaps in life? And again, obviously this is, you know, sort of tough to, to perhaps answer, but like, were there any specific events or, or, you know, realizations or just anything of the like that, that made you sort of come up with the current style, like the classic Trevor Jones style that you have at the moment? Like, like what were your, what were your periods of inspo? What did those come from? That's a really good question. I, I still don't know what my style is. And it's a difficult thing. I mean, you know, I think artists, you look at successful artists for the most part and, and they have a style, a very recognizable style, um, whether they're digital artists or a painter, sculptor or a printmaker, whatever they, you know, you have a style, just like a musician, you know, the, you know, you, you know your band and you can hear music, a piece by them and, and you know exactly, you hear that voice, you hear that style. Um, so for me, you know, st- I think finally after I graduated from Art College in 2008, I studied a five-year degree at Edinburgh College of Art and split between the university and, and the college. And it was a couple of years after that I started painting QR codes which was again a really ridiculous, silly decision to to make um, because there was no market <laughs> for it. Nobody, at the time, I'm thinking like, I am a freaking genius. You know, nobody in the world is painting QR codes. I mean, there were a few people, but um, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't really. I didn't see commercial galleries anywhere selling QR codes or tech fuel paintings. And so for me, I, you know, I was, I guess, naive in the sense that I thought, okay, this is my big breakthrough moment. I'm doing something that nobody else is doing. And I knew that, I guess, as an, as an artist, um, I was teaching part-time. I had a lot of friends who were exceptionally brilliant, talented artists. Um, I knew I needed to differentiate myself somehow to, to, to stand out, to be recognized. Uh, and as I started to incorporate more technology into traditional painting, the paintings that, and my, my style of painting changed and I guess I was trying to, um, in a way, like bang a, a square peg into a, a round hole because <laughs> it was the technology was driving the, the, my concepts, but the, the style, you know, whether I was going from abstract to landscape to abstract and landscape to figurative to, um, to QR codes to, you know, every, it was just constantly changing because I'm trying to, I was trying to, well, first off, make a living as an artist. You know, I'd, I'd spent six years all together. Um, with uh, my education here, foundation here, and then the five years at, at Edinburgh, that, and I was teaching part time, I was you know, running a, a small arts charity. But my goal was to somehow crack the code to become a, a full time painter. And, you know, I, I, I realized that the technolo- technology, that angle was not only something I was interested in, but it also did separate me from everybody else. But it was trying to vent, you know, somehow figure out a way that I could create work that I was interested in, but was also um, something that other people would be interested in as well. And that was the hard part. Uh, and that was where the struggle came in because it really was about six, seven, eight years of constant rejection to the point where I was setting my own uh, exhibitions. Commercial galleries weren't interested in showing my work anymore. They couldn't sell paintings that you had to download a, a, an app to your phone and scan it like a, you know, an AR painting or, you know, to scan this QR code um, or, you know, near field communication tags, all these different th- types of things I was ex- experimented with. And it wasn't until I, I fell down the Bitcoin uh, rabbit hole in 2017, then it, it started to make sense. Now that my, my vision was to create a series of crypto themed paintings, you know, that were, you know, in the sense, my experience of this crazy, volatile, wacky space with all these uh, amazing characters and, and geniuses. And, 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 you know, I mean, it was just a, a, a really amazing time for me. Um, although I did lose all my money in 2017, 18, but uh, at the same time, <laughs> it gave me a huge amount of inspiration. And that's when everything kind of linked up because I'd already been exploring technology for whatever, six, seven, eight years or so. And now I was able to find a, a theme, uh, a, a focal point for my ideas and my painting that all kind of came together around, um, you know, traditional painting, art, technology, 
um, new new themes of innovation and and cryptocurrency and and all the people within that space. So yeah, I mean, long story short, it it was just an ongoing struggle of trying to find something that, that fit with what I was interested in, and then with that kind of incorporation of technology. And so it it never really I never really made it back into the traditional art world because once things took off for me in 2018, um, you know, I. I, it just made sense to keep working in the space and then NFTs came about and just kept on going. Man, what a story. I love that shit. I got to clip that. This is this is just so cliche, classic 101. Like, do not give up. Like, you so easily probably could have just one day when your art was not selling at a gallery, you probably could have thrown the towel in and waved the white flag and said, you know what, maybe I'll just go do X, Y, or Z. And here you are today. I just, I love that shit. F- fuck, it fires me up. Yeah, I mean, between like 2000, probably 2012 to 2018, um, the amount of times that I, I would be in the studio thinking like, what the heck am I doing? Like, why why am I doing this? Why don't I just actually, I mean, I can still go back and be an artist as a traditional artist, just paint, paint, paint you, know, a, a ni- you know, nice landscapes or, or city scenes or figurative, find my niche market, my little niche market, um, continue to work part-time at the art school and, and these kind of things. But then... I, you know, I, I looked at the reality of it and the long term, and like I said, the the number of friends who I had and people I knew who were exceptionally, exceptionally gifted painters, and just couldn't make ends meet because the, the market wasn't there, demand wasn't there. It was it's a it's a tough, tough, very, very competitive market and conservative in Scotland, and you know, I just I, I didn't see myself being an arts charity director for the rest of my life, so. I, it was, you know, that Hail Mary pass just to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this work one way. And I, you know, okay, I threw that to Hail Mary about 20,000 times over six years, but eventually it was caught and, uh, you know, got the touchdown. All you need is one. I love how you sort of changed, not sort of how you totally changed from QR codes over to sort of the whole Bitcoin and crypto sphere of things. Even just looking at your background behind you, you know, I can see the the big Wall Street right there. Like you tuck so many hidden innuendos and motifs and references into every one of your, not every, almost all of your artwork. And it's just like, I also find it so interesting how there's such a, we have this weirdo niche culture and, you know, in Bitcoin, crypto and NFTs where like you're in, including rocket ships and and you know, little Doge coins here, and and Wall Streets, and Elon Musk, and Satoshi Nakamoto's, and four twenty blaze it. Like it's just, <laughs> how much fun is it just being able to include all these little motifs and references? And like, how do you choose which ones to throw into your art at certain times? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question as well. Um, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, a, a, a painter or you know, an artist, a visual artist, has to create a piece that makes sense visually, um, compositionally. Right. And, and that's where it, the, the real skill comes in. It's, it's, it's deciding what not to put in. You know, if you overload something visually, it just becomes an absolute mess. So the, the ideas come about, whether it's a, a series of paintings or one particular painting. And then I start, I use Photoshop a lot, to be honest, to really kind of look at how I can compose an image in such a way that it, it makes sense visually, that it's aesthetically a ple- a pleasing and it's not overloaded with, but at the same time, it portrays and, and conveys the message that I'm trying to say. So yeah, it really is just a constant change and, and experimenting and moving things around. And, and that's why, you know, back in the olden days, before computers, artists would just have their sketchbook and just constantly be sketching things out and, you know, very quick, quick sketches. Then they kind of develop that sketch a bit more into something bigger than have their the smaller paintings and, and then eventually develop into the full scale, large oil painting. For me, it's, and I think for a lot of artists nowadays, it's a lot of computer work. So you just, it's easier to kind of compose something on, on Photoshop. So quick. Yeah. And then that's exactly, I just move things around and, and start playing with different layers until eventually things start to make sense visually. And then it's like, okay. And it, usually it just kind of clicks. It's very, it's a lot of fun, but it's, it takes a lot of time to really finally make sense of, of all these as, as visuals and that as a series. And now I'm creating a whole story and mythology around these paintings. And it's been, you know, it's been almost, well, actually over two years I've been working on this piece. It's like the one behind me, it's, it's huge. It's 11 it's feet by, ten, by six feet tall. So 
Yeah, with regards to all the different visuals and, and icons, iconography and symbolism, it's just a lot of fun. And this, this space that we're in, the crypto space, there's just so much symbolism and, and potentials for metaphors and analogies in and, and all different parts of life and what we're doing that uh, it's just fun creating stories and using visuals to, to convey that, that message. So cool. I always think back to the famous Drake line. It's like, art, uh, we want to be like athletes and they want to be like us. It's like artists always, it, well, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking the words out of his mouth, but I think like someone like me who's more of an athlete than an artist. And I, like I said, I'd kill to be able to do what you do. And it's just crazy because I could never, ever even do anything like that. But we got to talk about AI as well, Trevor. And I, and I know you've been screwing around with AI as well. I follow you on Twitter. That's got to be a pretty cool tool to just get crazy inspiration. You know, like you literally type in 30 words and it spits out exactly what, maybe not what you wanted, but at least gives it gives you a reference point, which is pretty darn cool. Like how have you been playing around with AI and do you think that AI art will be as big as a lot of people say it's going to be? It's for me, again, it's just a tool. It's an amazing tool. Um, at the end of the day, look, you know, my maybe unpopular opinion, but, you know, based on a, a lot of years in, in the art space is that with AI, it's, it really is a tool and AI isn't going to supersede painting or, or push. It will, it will force creatives to think differently and to, to work on the, the idea, the message, the, the story. You know, anybody now can become an artist in a sense by using Mid Journey or Dali and create something that brand new from that came from essentially almost nothing in a way. But at the end of the day, the real, real true artists have something really important to say. And and how they say that is, you know, through visuals and, and through animation, through music and all these different things. So you still have to have the ideas and the concept. And so it doesn't matter what mid-journey can do for you. If, if you just kind of throw words around and come up with some cool visuals, you know, who cares? But the greatest artists throughout history have always had, they've been relevant, they've been topical, they've been saying something about society at that time, whatever it was, um, and, and they had an important message. And they've developed a, a unique style that that represented that time in history as well. And and that they created, whether it was, you know, the futurists or Picasso and the Cubism or, uh, you know, the the impressionists or the realists, all these different, the different genres and, and, and styles of, um, an evolution of art. It, you can't, and, and this again, AI is, is just a, a moment in time and people will be able to look at the art that's being, a lot of the art, the digital art, AR, AI art that's being created now, whether it's in three years or five years or a hundred years and look back and go, that is a, the, the art of 2023. But within all the millions and millions and millions of pieces that get created, there will only be a very small number of artists whose work will transcend all of this and be an important and relevant point for for history in this time. So you know, AI is a, is a great tool, but it's 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 how the the creator decides to use the tool and the message that they say that is important and that will make it good or bad art. So true as well. Like when you go to the art gallery or just when you're at a museum or whatever, there's always a story behind every piece. Like what's what's the story going to be behind Matt Sehab making some, you know, golfing Bitcoin panda? <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's, you know, it's like, oh, he was at his computer one day after his podcast with Trevor Jones and uh, decided to throw this into Dali. Like it's, God, I feel like there's got to be a little more to that to it. Unless, that's a, that's unless, a, unless there's a way to somehow incorporate the story, then I could maybe see a little. Well, that's a scary thing actually with like chat GPT, you know, you could actually, you could, you could literally say, okay, you know, write me a story about a, a great art theme for 2023 in 2000 words or something like that. And then you start taking, developing that story. And then you take that. those and put them yeah. into visuals in the mid journey. And, and next thing you know, you have a, a series of, uh, of artworks created entirely by AI that actually is really, really good. So that's quite scary to, <laughs> in itself. It's, it's too much fun. Um, folks, going to take a quick break. When we get back, we are going to talk about the exclusive castle party at the Sterling Castle in 2022. We're running it back for 2023. It was a banger. 
And we will be jumping into that as well as the Bitcoin Angel, one of the most famous NFTs of all time. We have a new sponsor on the show, and I'm super pumped that Undead Metaverse is now sponsoring the Crypto News Pod. These guys have the ultimate gaming experience with Undead. It is a post apocalyptic world with an above the ground city for humans and underground layers for zombies, all powered by the blockchain. This unique game is designed to blend top level mechanics with play to earn rewards, developed by an incredible team led by Leo Khan, a former PayPal exec, and Ash Hodgetts, former CMO of Animoca's Phantom Galaxies. Undead's Metaverse has over 5 million already invested and is making waves, creating an incredible experience for all of their gamers. Undeads has also secured partnerships with top industry players such as Warner Bros, ever heard of them, Wabi Sabi Sound, and many more to come. Rich gameplay, a VR experience, and healthy and efficient game economy verified by machinations.io. Join the conversation at undeads.com and sign up for the whitelist now. And now back to the show with Trevor. Trevor, before we get into the castle party, I think we got to go Bitcoin Angel first. That was absolutely insane. Walking through the whole story, like from the creation of it to the sale of it, uh, did you ever think that that much money would get raised for it? Like just an incredible story. You got you to give me the deets on it. The painting, the Bitcoin Angel painting was created in 2018 during that. I, I started the, the themes around this crypto disruption exhibition uh, end of 2017 before I even knew if there was going to be a market, if there would be anybody interested in crypto-themed paintings. I had hired a gallery uh, here in Edinburgh to for a week or 10 days just to, you know, knowing that I wouldn't sell any of the work, um, but it was just an opportunity to kind of take photos and and put it on social media and and just kind of hang out in the gallery with my my paintings that nobody wanted here in, in Edinburgh. And the Bitcoin Age was one of them. And that came, like I said, from that series of of paintings that represented my very early experience in the crypto uh, crypto scene. And the Bitcoin Angel represented, I mean, a lot of different things. First off, it's Bernini's uh, 16th century sculpture that in Rome, the actually say Teresa with the Bitcoin behind. So it's a very simple um, change in the status from, well, a, a painting, a three-dimensional enormous sculpture 2D and adding the Bitcoin with the golden rays coming down. Uh, I had no, I mean, this was pre-NFTs uh, that it was painted. And I just thought, you know, that this is going to be a painting and maybe somebody will 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 like it. And then obviously things changed. My first NFT drop was in end of 2019 with a lot of money. And I started to revisit my old crypto themed paintings and think like, you know, I could actually digitize these, animate them, tell a, a fuller story around the artwork. So the Bitcoin Angel 101 uh, animation would drop, I think actually was uh, on my birthday, March 26th in 2020. And then eventually came around to late, or sorry, early 2021. And at that point, things had really started taking off. I'd had my collaboration with Jose Dalbo. I had my collaboration with Pac. Uh, I had the ETH boy, initial ETH boy drop with Lauda. And I did this from palette to canvas exhibition, a retrospective. I think the first retrospective ever in the crypto, uh, crypto art scene. And I decided to do an open edition of the Bitcoin Angel. And it was uh, $777. I had a 777 actually on the, the, the digital, digitized artwork itself. And I had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, there obviously was a, a huge shift and had been going on for what, maybe six or seven months, eight months from the Bitcoin bowl, actually in July of 2020. And things were really kind of taken off for me and, and the crypto art scene in general. But when uh, it was a seven minute open edition and I was, you know, I was with my wife sitting on the couch and um, all pumped. The, the, there was another, I think, 14 or 15 101s that were going to be dropping the next day on Nifty Gateway. But this was, the open edition was a, the big thing. And, and there'd, there'd been a lot of talk about it, but uh, I didn't want to get my hopes up. And my wife's going like, you know, Trev, just put the phone down, don't look. She took my phone out of my hand, put it in, a, in the, the pillowcase, zipped it up on the couch and didn't let me. I was like drinking wine like you wouldn't believe. 
And she uh, <laughs> eventually, um, after like eight minutes or something, you know, said, okay, here's your phone back. And I just opened up and looked at the 4,158 editions minted, which was absolutely mind blowing um, and, and earth shattering and, and record breaking. Uh, so it was about $3.2 million in seven minutes. And then the next day, there was another million in, in one of one sold um, with the physical paintings being sent out to all the, the winners as well. And that was the, the beginning of, of some pretty crazy times, just trying to deal with the, the ups and downs and the stress and the, the good things and the bad things. It's been a, a, a nonstop roller coaster ride ever since. What a life-changing moment. What, what was the first word that came out of your mouth or first words when your wifey unzipped the pillow and gave you the like, phone? Fuck yourself. Yeah, just, just a, <laughs> big, a big F-bomb. It had to be. Like, I, don't yeah. mean, I, I, I think I would have... <laughs> no, yeah, you can swear. It's, it's, uh, it's not a kid-friendly show. So I, I probably would have done a couple laps around my house, like running around with tears of joy, would have definitely been present. Like, that, that's a life-changing moment. Like, that's crazy. You know, the, the funny thing, um, at the time, I mean, initially it was... She was right, like, yeah, within that, that, that night, uh, I think it was probably about, I can't remember the exact time, it would have been maybe like 10 o'clock at night here in Scotland. And, you know, once it happened, the, the, obviously Twitter just went crazy, crypto oh, yeah. Twitter. Um, There's an enormous amount of positivity and, and congratulations. But at the same time, there were, of course, there's always a, the pushback and people who were not happy about it. And, and, and there was some ideas going around that I ruined my career because I'd saturated the market now. And this was kind of the time of one of ones uh, you know, it, open editions had, had only been around for, you know, maybe I'm kind of taken off in the last couple of months. So the next day I was in, in two minds. I was like over the moon, ecstatic. Holy crap. My whole life has changed. Um, this is, this is really realistic and crazy. And I've also ruined my career and I'm not going to have, uh, and now I'm, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I've, nobody's going to want to buy my work because it's, there's too many, there's too much of it out there. But what I've discovered in this space over this, you know, the every, it seems like every three months, something big happens and things change and tastes change and trends change. And what was considered a bad form or, or not good or something, you know, something terrible that you, you shouldn't do that. Three to six months later, everybody's doing it you know, and what, you know, the trends change. So, you know, it took a lot of time and, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs, but I think what I've learned is that always stay true to yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you don't know how things are going to roll out. You have no idea, but if something big does happen, like happened to me with Bitcoin angels that you have to number one, take responsibility and accountability and you have to adapt and you have to be aware that you'll have to kind of rethink things and, and be flexible. And that, is a nice segue into the castle party because that's exactly what the castle party, how it came about. Well, that's again, so happy for you, man. That's incredible. I just, um, to, to all the listeners who are ever doubting themselves, just keep hauling ass, keep working hard, keep going to the studio every single day. Trevor never left the lab. You know, I'm sure there were times you wanted to, and, and here we are. And next up, we got the castle party, which looked like an absolute banger. The Sterling Castle, like when I was doing research for the show, I was like, okay, how sick of a castle could this be? This is a legit castle. This isn't some Disneyland castle. This is like a legit castle from way back in time. You got to walk me through how all of that went down and, and sort of if any, if you have any good stories from last year's event and perhaps what to look forward to at this year's event. Yeah. Uh, so after literally maybe what, eight, 10 days after the Bitcoin angel drop, um, I was talking to, I was, I was only there like, you know, what's, what's going on? How do I, how do I, how do I make the best of the situation? I mean, it's already a great situation, but how do I how do I make sure that it's it's only positives? And one of my big collectors said, like, just was joking around, said, like, why don't you throw a castle party? And I thought, yeah, why not? And you know, without really thinking how much work it's going to be, but uh, you know, as soon as I put in my mind something, um, and that's I think part of the the thing, the reason why I did it is because, you know, in this, it's if you do if you say you're going to do something, you do it. You know, the, you do, I think having credibility in the space, there's a lot of rug pulls, there's a lot of scams, there's a lot of bad actors. And for the people who are here and who are genuine and legitimate and, and filled with integrity, people recognize that. So doing something big like having a castle party and actually pulling it off and, and putting all the work into it to get it, to get it done and to hold it, 
um, and to have 300 people from 22 different countries fly into Scotland for this party and pull it off. Um, you know, that I think for me, it, I mean, it was a, a huge honor to be able to do that, but also I think it, it proves to people that I'm here to stay. You know, this isn't, this isn't for me, I'm not in and out. I'm not going to make some money and take off that I'm here for the, the long game. So when I was looking at, okay, here's the castle. We need, need to find a castle. Uh, I started looking around Scotland and different places. I looked at Edinburgh Castle and, and what it would cost to hire that. And But then also it was finding a place that could hold a decent amount of people. There's tons of beautiful castles in Scotland, but you might be able to put 50 or 100 or 120 people in. So Stirling Castle was one of my favorite castles. It's um, it's just, it's it's beautiful inside, outside. It's huge. We could fit 400 maximum. Um, there's just so much history there. And like you said, it is a castle. It's like a, a real castle. You know, and I like that history that this isn't um, a palace. You know, there's been bloodshed in this castle. There's been wars in this castle. There's been a lot of... Uh, <laughs> A lot of ghosts and a lot of um, bad things have happened. And I liked, and that's what I thought, if I'm going to have a party and, you know, inspired by art and the history and culture, I want a castle with a lot of, a lot of stories to tell. So we hired uh, a number of um, kind of actor historians that were dressed up. They, 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 that's their job. They go, they're at the castle and they basically talk to visitors from around the world and, and tell them that the history of the castle of Scotland and uh, they're, they're brilliant, you know, absolutely amazing, uh, you know, very, very entertaining. So, you know, having all these guests come in from all around the world and, and just really find out the the history of this space. But I'd also use augmented reality. I'd, I'd hidden my artwork all around the castle in different places. Um, so you could scan different banners and tapestries and see my Bitcoin angel. Um, you know, we had a DJ, had open bar, uh, everything you could eat and drink. Um, it was just a, a, an amazing opportunity to bring my supporters together to celebrate the Bitcoin angel, to celebrate the crypto space, NFTs, and and to to meet IRL and to actually build real friendships through through real human interaction. It's it's crazy how much goes into throwing like a legit party or event, eh? Like I don't know if this was the you said you were an art director before this, so you've you've definitely thrown your fair share of bangers yeah, at charity not, events. Not like this, <laughs> but not <laughs> like at a ca- not at a castle. Like yeah, they're throwing a party at an event at a conference venue, and then they're throwing an event at a castle. Like there must have been some very weird things that you learned that you know you would have probably never expected. <laughs> it was a lot of stress uh, because I'd never thrown anything like this before. Done anything like this before? It was the unknowns. You know what what right. can go wrong. Um, what what will go wrong? Uh, what's to watch out for? And I've got two great guys. You know, my, my team. I said, oh, you know, I was joking at the castle party. Said, you know, I've got my enormous team. I got forty guys who working for me. And then everybody's like, what forty guys? That's like, you know. I said, I'm joking. I've got two two guys. It's me and <laughs> me and Martin and David, and they are just amazing to to work with. And they really were the 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 brawn behind. You know, the muscle behind. You know, I have the crazy ideas. And they kind of help me push things Execute. through. So yeah, having yeah. a good team around you is absolutely essential, even if it's a, a very small team. You gotta, you, you, of course, you gotta plug this year's party. Give me some dates, tickets, whole nine yards. Walk me through what's going on. September third to fifth. Uh, so yeah, that's what we learned with the last one. Is that is it's great to have a party, but you need more time. And for me, I didn't have um, enough time to really talk to people. So we thought let's have a, a three day, two night event. It gives me more time to to hang out and just chat with people and have a glass of wine and that kind of thing. I was all over the place. Uh, everybody was saying, like, the last one, you know, it was like um, a, a, like a wedding without the boring parts. But for me, it was just literally running around. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of, you know, made sense. It was a lot of fun, but I, I just didn't get enough time. I was like the groom, you know, and I couldn't actually talk to people and meet people. So three days, two nights in France, about an hour south of Paris called uh, uh, Renaissance, Chateau uh, called um, they're in it's called uh, Chateau de Valerie, and I think it's a fifth, built in fifteen fifty five. There's actually a part of it underground caves, which is medieval, I think twelfth century, and that's a, a wine cellar. We'll be having wine tastings in there, all by candlelight. Um, you know, there's we've got we'll have a couple of DJs, we'll have pool parties with the DJs, we'll have fireworks at night. Um, we've got a, a football uh, five on five or soccer five on five tournament. We're going to hopefully have a, a, a room filled for um, potentially 
for a, a poker. Um, we could have like a you know a poker event. Um, yeah, and it's just pulling out all the all the stops here. Like this is yeah, this is my kind of shaker. Be, <laughs> <laughs> you got to come, yeah. Matt. You're invited. Definitely, I, I'd love to. I'm going to book this off. Um, Trevor, what a treat, man! I, I know we're getting tight for time. This has been so much fun. Um, we always have a hot take. We well, we have a segment on the show called the Hot Take Factory where we jump in, let a couple of hot takes fly, perhaps something you believe in, whereas most other people do not. You got to give me a couple of Trevor Jones hot takes before we go. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be like AI or crypto or art or anything. It can just be any, anything in life hot takes. Hot takes. Gosh. You know, I can't be controversial because, um, you know, I can ruin my career. I've lived my, 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 my I've, 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 I've I used to be a lot more, you know, kind of poke the bear on, on social media, on Twitter. Um, but by, you know, 2020, I was trying to be, people were trying to cancel me. So I, I now tend to keep my mouth shut. And my hot take is um, <laughs> life is a lot easier when you keep your mouth shut, put your nose down, work hard, and uh, and try not to offend anybody. Um, I save all my hot takes for, uh, that is I've person for my wife. <laughs> 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 well said. <laughs> that came out the wrong way, but uh, yeah, my wife and I are, are absolutely. Uh, she 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 just makes me laugh all the time with how politically incorrect she is, and all the uh, the things that she says is just you know absolutely kind of make me make roll with laughter. Uh, hot takes, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, Matt. I'm letting you down here. Hey, Trev, in person, I'm sure you'll let a couple fly when uh, we're in uncancelable territory. Absolutely. Also, your accent is like, it's too good. You know, you have a bit of a Scottish accent now, right? Like you've developed, has, I'm sure, has anyone ever told you that? Yeah. I, well, I go back home to, you know, my mom will say, oh, he sounds so, he sounds so Scottish. And I'm like, no, I don't. I sound Canadian. Um, and when I'm over here, people are like, you don't sound, you know, Scottish at all, you're full on Canadian, but it's, uh, I think there are certain things probably comes out a bit more after a, a couple of beers. So oh, yeah. if you come to the castle party, get a couple of beers in me and you'll be like, what did you just say, man? <laughs> <laughs> it, it flies. Trev, thanks for coming on, man. Before you go, you got to let our listeners know where they can find you and all your endeavors online and on social. And as always, I will include everything in the show notes, um, but you got to let us know where everyone can find you online and on socials. It's very easy. Trevor Joe's art everything so trevorjonesart.com website trevor jones art on twitter trevor jones art on instagram i really only use twitter and my website to to really kind of showcase my work and what i'm doing and discord and you can find my discord uh at my on my twitter bio uh that's pretty much everything you need to know trev thanks man truly had an absolute blast chatting with you would love to have you on for round two and hopefully i will be in beautiful france having a glass of vino with you maybe playing Absolutely. some five on five football maybe a little poker at the castle party but until next time thanks again and we will keep in touch my pleasure matt it's really nice speaking with you folks what an episode with trevor jones as always do go check him out on twitter and his website trevorjonesart.com i love these episodes when it's a little more non-tech related and you know very very personable have always have so much fun doing these huge shout out to trevor for blessing us with his time if you guys enjoyed this one, please do subscribe. It would mean the world. And to the team, love you guys. As always, to Eustace, my amazing editor, appreciate you and all your hard work. Back to the listeners, love you guys. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.